All right, this is going to start off great. I'm already watching the live chat, and this is this is, this is going to be epic. Um, yeah, welcome to my second uh, little uh, thing going on with Christian Apologetics. The first one I had one with Cy Gart, uh, PhD in biochemistry, who uh, doesn't really do apologetics per se, but is quite familiar with the arguments. But um, I reached out to another friend of mine who I had the absolute pleasure of meeting in person. And uh, I got to tell you, one of the nicest guys I, I think I've ever met, and don't let that go to your head, uh, Eric. But I invite him back on to kind of hey, say, hey, you know, you have a kind of a different approach to apologetics. Maybe uh, come on in and talk about your position. And he just has a recent book out that I put in the video description, but I'll let him go over it. But uh, welcome to the Non Sequitur Show, Eric Hernandez. Hey, thanks for having me. About time. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, I know, right? Um, I, and I, but I ser seriously, I, I really thought you had been on Non Sequitur before. Am mm -mm. I way wrong? First time. Wow. Well, hopefully they can hear you. It looks like everything's good on my end, but I always check the audio from the outside. Let me know. And, okay, so, so this is what they're saying so far. Before we get started, let me uh, just give you the um, the general view of the uh, live chat. Um, Willie Mays fan, who's been a longtime subscriber, younger creationist, says, wow, you have Eric Hernandez? Question mark. <laughs> That's make you feel good. Uh, look at you, Steve. Uh, Anna's Frieder, who's been a long time subscriber says, I hope this guy is not as crazy as the last one. <laughs> Debatable. <We'll see. laughs> Debatable. Uh, <clears throat> and, and no. Um, but anyways, so, so Eric, tell people about your ministry. Tell people about your, uh, a little bit about your uh, history of the apologetics in your book. And, uh, this kind of just have free for discussion on the state of apologetics in the uh, YouTube environment. Uh, yeah, so thank, uh, again, thanks for having me on. Uh, as you said, my name is Eric Hernandez. I am the apologetics lead for the Baptist Journal Convention of Texas, which encompasses everything from uh, going to churches, uh, teaching at churches, um, even um, doing seminars. Also, I'm in charge of three annual, what we call the Unapologetic Evangelism Conferences that we host all around the state of Texas, um, and also getting the privilege of being on fine shows like this. Ah, oh, so sweet. See, reciprocity there. I compliment him, and he, he returns yeah. it in kind. Um, and, and yeah, we, and we, so we actually did meet at a atheist theist book club. They had asked me to do a seminar on epistemology. Um, yeah. and I, and I thought it went very well. I'm not going to sit there and toot yeah. my own horn, but I, I thought I, I held my own. I, I battled the questions from both apologists, from theists, from atheists. And, uh, you know, I gave my views on epistemology and, uh, it was, it was fun. It was a really good time. And, uh, I want, I want to do that again. I really do. Cause there are some things that I didn't yeah. even get a chance to get over. And that was four years ago. And. I think I even more familiarized myself with these subjects even better after four years later. So, but uh, anyway, so you have a book out and the name of the book is called. <clears throat> it's called the lazy approach to evangelism, a simple guide for conversing with nonbelievers with by a lazy writer. Right? No, I'm, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> That's I, right. I, um, I have skimmed it. Um, I didn't read all of it in depth because it's a pretty, pretty big size book, but uh, I got the, I got the gist of it. So, um, as I understand it, you wanted to reach out to to Christians and kind of explain why they have apologetics and different approaches, because we both of us has been on the scene for quite some time. And we've seen some pretty bad arguments from both sides of the fence. I get criticized both by theists and atheists because I, I say to people, look, your argument's bad. Let's explain why. And I don't try to explain it as your argument's bad because some stupid fallacy that doesn't even apply. Right. Or some misunderstanding of how a syllogism works. Right. I try to actually give. Uh, uh, more in deep in depth um, criticisms based upon my, just my views, but standard views by uh, philosophers out there and how they would attack these types of arguments. Correct. And so, yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. So, so you, you wanted to reach out to, to the Christians and kind of tell them what about apologetics? Uh, yeah. So, so great question. Um, well, a few things. So it's, it's published by GC2 Press, which is uh, one of our pub uh, our publisher uh, at Texas Baptist. And so I realized a few things writing this book. One would be um, that there are going to be people who read this or buy this, not necessarily because it's apologetics or because it's Eric Hernandez, but because it's published by a trusted source, you know, that, that they're affiliated with. And so I, I took advantage of that opportunity to, as you're, as you're mentioning, <clears throat> um, so where the first two or three chapters is essentially an apologetics for apologetics um, as to why, as believers, we should be engaging this, how it's a biblical mandate and whatnot. And, of course, like you're saying, I, I, I fully agree. Um, <clears throat> I've often said that, obviously, as a Christian, I would say that we serve a, uh, and have a God of order, rationality, and logic. And if we're made in his image, we had better reflect that. And so we shouldn't be um, – defending Christianity with, with fallacious reasoning. Um, and of course, what, what some people don't realize, and I, and I know you do, is um, 
that you can have a true conclusion but still reason to that conclusion in an erroneous way. And that's one of the many things in the book that that I uh, address is, you know, we, we shouldn't be presenting fallacious or bad arguments. Uh, some people would call like lying for Jesus, right? Some people do believe that um, if you um, convert somebody, the ends justify the means, which is almost like a Machiavellian type approach. But I just don't think that is an honest approach, because if you have to to lie to the infidel, so to speak, or lie to the heretic to get them to convert, then are you really putting forth a honest just righteous good message right and i i apologize for the people right. listening i have roof work going on that i can't do anything about um it's loud but it should go away pretty quickly and i'll mute when when eric's talking uh so let me get this out then i'll mute and then uh, you can answer the question um but like somebody had to ask um for you know uh, what you know what is your best reasoning for apologetics what is it about apologetic arguments specifically um as far as beyond just your testimony that will convert you know the the atheist or you know keep the atheist believing but i will say this before i mute because it's getting loud um your, your your chapter on atheism was was absolutely perfect i mean you i i, I swear to god i thought i wrote it and i'm not saying you plagiarized <laughs> i know that but there's no doubt in my mind i've influenced you on this topic because your wording is is pretty much exactly how I would, if I was to write this book, I would probably written it the same as you. Um, it, it, it's almost scary. And I, and I do think that I have influence, you know, in that, in that in, in, somewhat on that, on you, don't, do I not? <laughs> uh, well, yeah, I mean, I, I would say, uh, um, you know, many influences. Um, I, I like to think of it this way is that great minds think alike, right? Um, so uh, now what I like uh, that you've done, because, you know, for me, that's just a, a short section. Uh, it's a, a, maybe it's like chapter three, who am I talking to? And I lay out three types of non-believers, uh, the atheist, the agnostic, and the skeptic. And, <clears throat> and then I, I take a, a brief few sections to lay out how something that you've done a lot more work on is how the burden of proof is, is, is seems to be there seems to be an attempt to shift the burden of proof um, when people define atheism and don't want to get into that you've written tons on that and I've pointed people I, to stuff I have, you've yeah. done. We have we've read that <laughs> horse over and over again right it's, yeah it's glue <laughs> but you know point. Yeah, but you know, your average Christian may not be familiar with some of these things. Um, and so I, I took that as an opportunity to at least lay out the landscape. Um, and, and so, and, and I think some of these things, I, I think if you just think about them for a little bit, they're relatively obvious. And, and um, so, yeah, so I, I think great minds think alike, but you know, I've, like I said, I've pointed people to stuff you've done because you've really taken it and just really ran with it uh, when it comes to those definitions. You know, it's so funny, too, because I, I put my stuff out there on my blog and then I put my stuff out on Twitter and Facebook. And I got to tell you, it's three different worlds, right? The people that read my blog are usually more people that have an interest in philosophy and things of that nature. And I get very little, if any, criticism from things in my blog, which is surprising, you know, because, you know, my blog's out there. But, you know, I post a lot on it. I mean, I, I'm not as, as um, prolific as I was was on it, I, I cut back. But I mean, you don't see a lot of people arguing stuff in my blog because most people that follow my blog, it's this is second nature to that. This is not something that is, you know, you know some kind of groundbreaking yeah. stuff. I mean, my paper, all my paper did was take what Oppie argued and prove it. That's it. I mean, he, he, mm. he came up with the ideas, but I logically proved it. But you go, you go to a Facebook group and it's like the old West. It is. These people are fruit <laughs> on the ground. They're, you know, because I have, I have like, you know, you have low hanging fruit. Well, I have something called fruit on the ground, which is people that are even lower than the low hanging fruit, <laughs> you know, flat earthers kind of stuff. And so, you know, when I run my, you know, when I put an argument on Facebook and I get this stupidest response is like, um, well, your argument is not um, good because it starts with the word if. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Right. So a conditional implication, a basic if, then, you know, if P then Q, which is a form of every single modus ponens and dolens, uh, they say, no, that's a bad argument because it's not logical because, you, you know, if well, anything's if and I'm like, I think yeah. you're not understanding logical argumentation. So those are the arguments that I criticize when they have a counter argument to me. So in, in your view for you have your apologetics, do you prefer more to to explain to the theist why some of the arguments are not bad or which one's better to use? Because you, you, you recognize that these arguments like, oh, the infidel, you're going to hell if you don't believe me, is not going to work you know, against most people. So do you, do you want to try to focus more on the, the theist to get them better arguments or point out the bad argumentations of atheists? Because I, I do a little bit of both, obviously. Uh, yeah, I mean, I would say a little bit of both. Um, so, you know, obviously we disagree on, on some things. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm a Christian. Uh, to my knowledge, you're still agnostic. Is that right? 
Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, I, lean, I mean, sure. I lean toward toward atheism. I I deny the Christian God. Um, I think he was just a man. I'm not a mythicist. I'm not that. That's flat earth territory to me. Um, I'm a you know a yeah. historicist. Um, so I'm, yeah, as you say, great minds think alike. We're, I don't I, I don't understand how anybody be a mythicist, but whatever. And I'm not prolific in that particular area. <laughs> I haven't read that much in it, but um, you know. Uh, I, I, I still think that, you know, the possibility of God existing of some form of some kind of intelligence as a necessary being still leaves me pause to really just be able to to sit there and, and, and rationally justify a belief that there is no such being. So I remain agnostic. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I think you're one of the, the few agnostics that I personally know that I can say, yeah, I think they're genuinely agnostic, um, which because, you know, it won't don't want to get into the definition stuff, but you know how that's been misused. So, um, yeah, I'd say a little bit too, of both, well, all so. too well. I just don't believe yeah. I lack a belief. I have no burden of justification. Shut up. <laughs> right. So. Um, <clears throat> so on the one hand, as a Christian, um, you know, I, I think first and foremost, Christians need to be uh, aware, uh, need. To, so. Um, if you don't mind putting on my pastoral hat, if you will, um, you know, the, the greatest commandment when they ask Jesus, what is the greatest commandment out of all the commandments in the Old Testament? Um, and of course, I, I like to ask people how many commandments are there and they someone usually says 10 and I say close enough. It's 613, but 10's, 10's close. And out but of those, all those these. The mitzvahs, like, though, but those are the those are the Levitical mitzvah, the mitzvahs, right? Would you, you but still would be commands. OK. All right. yeah, they're, yeah. They're, they're definitely. Yeah, they're definitely something to be prescribed as you don't do right their directives uh some of some are those uh, without getting into the details there but you know just consider you know what i'm getting at here where they ask jesus which is a greatest commandment and what he names is not one of the 10 right so correct, in the in correct. the in okay. the jewish mind there weren't just 10 that's more of uh, something that kind of our culture has come up with that term uh, so to speak um okay so out of all 10 he says the greatest is to love the lord god with your heart mind soul and strength and in a nutshell Again, without going into all the details, you have that word mind, which if you were to look up in the Greek, it, uh, indicates your intellectual reasoning, your capacity f for understanding, your rationality. And so what I like to remind Christians is that if we are going to fulfill the greatest commandment, then that will encompass loving God intellectually. Um, and what does that look like? And of course, I go out, uh, go through some stuff there in the book. And on the other hand, also, you know, just knowing what other people believe is important. Um, <clears throat> you know, I... One of the things I can appreciate about the scholarly atheists, you know, setting aside the Twitter, YouTube, Facebook, online atheists, you know, the, the scholarly atheists, where they're putting forth, you know, objections that I think are fair objections. And what that should force the believer to do is go back and look into these things. You know, what what is a solution to X, Y, or Z or problem of evil, pain and suffering, things like that. Um, free will, God's, you know, omniscience, all, you know, fill in the blank. And what I think that does is that is part of loving God with your mind and that spills out into apologetics, which I would tie in with evangelism whenever you're speaking with someone. So as a quick example, <clears throat> um, I, I often, in the book, I say something like, you know, chances are when you present the gospel or Christianity to a skeptic, they're going to reject it. Um, but let's be darn sure, if you will, that the God they're rejecting is actually a God that even the Bible itself would accept. In other words, we don't want someone to reject a God that the Bible is going to reject. So we don't want to present a false view of God because we don't take the time to intellectually love him with our minds. And so, like, as an application point, then I'll let you, you know, uh, take it where you want from here. <clears throat> like, let, let's say, uh, to, to throw something out where someone's a, a non-believer, an atheist might say, well, I don't believe in a sky daddy. And my response, hence it's called the laser approach, my response would be like, cool, me neither. So, so what do you want to talk about next, right? Um, and what I and one of the other reasons I'm writing the book to uh, to go there as well is because I've seen even apologists or even people who are familiar with apologetics they get bogged down in these red herring, irrelevant issues or like you said, inflammatory language uh, that to me is just a waste of time. So in my quote unquote lazy approach, it's you know I don't believe in a sky daddy. Well, me either. You know I'm not going to defend whether or not I believe in a sky daddy because I don't, and I'm not going to play that game with you. Yeah. Um, or you know if someone's um, I don't know just just throwing something out there that I as a Christian wouldn't believe, I, I'm not going to again go down the rabbit trail of trying to refute a straw man that I don't hold myself. Yeah, and I was muted for that little segment because again I'm trying to cut down the noise out there. They they literally just stopped banging. Um, 
But I was telling Eric that I said, you know, I've, I've been on record out there telling atheists to stop using the term sky daddy because it is very childish. It's a straw man. It doesn't get anywhere. It's very inflammatory, very pejorative. And I get when people want to mock religion. I understand that approach. I'm a, I, people know I'm a fan of the, the, the satanic temple because, um, you know, they, they, there's a little mockery there. But, it, it, but you know, they're, they use it in a way to, 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 to show some of the the issues with hypocrisy in Christianity from their point of view, right? So I'm not against, you know, some forms of mockery, but I mean, make take it to a higher level at least, you know, even from the, the theists, there's some theist stuff that mocks atheists. I'm like, that's pretty good, you know, but, but this whole sky daddy thing, just stop. I mean, nobody wants to hear it any longer. It doesn't add anything to the dialogue. And it just shows that you have no ability to actually discuss the topics on any kind of real level. Um, but yeah, so, so I, I agree with you on that uh, wholeheartedly uh, on, on your approach there. Yeah, and so it's just essentially the, the principle that, uh, again, you know, you want to know what you believe, um, and that way when a straw man comes, you can point it out, and at the same time, know what other people believe. So this is uh, your other part of your question about some of the weaknesses or, you know, problems with uh, an atheistic worldview, and to just name a few, um, so anyone who's seen any of my videos know that um, – one of my favorite uh, areas of focus is philosophy of mind. And so this gets into the question of things like free will and consciousness, essentially. And in, in a nutshell, here's a story I share in my book. <clears throat> um, I was at a, a, a friend's company Christmas party. And, you know, as I was, uh, you know, meeting some of, uh, of uh, the friends and the other coworkers, uh, one person, when they heard, you know, what I did, they said, oh, well, I used to be a Christian, but now I'm an atheist. And I said, oh, interesting. Why is that? And long story short, they basically said um, there were two two factors. One is the realization there was no free will um, because, you know, before you're born, you don't get to choose your parents. Uh, had you been born in the East, you'd be a Muslim, yada, yada. And then the other idea that um, that religion is a cause of a lot of uh, um, immorality in the world, a lot of suffering in the world, you know, suppressing these people's rights or taking away this out of the other. And then the person said, and as someone who wants to always follow the truth and evidence where it leads, you know, I decided atheism was the best way to go. Okay. <clears throat> so given that, you know, we're at a Christmas party, I don't want to, you know, start a fight or anything like that. Um, I, I just, you know, took a Socratic method, right? Where I'm just going to ask some questions and, and point out what I see as flaws in what he just said. So I just summarized and said, so it seems like two factors that led you to your atheism. Uh, first and foremost, that you want to follow the evidence. And then the first being that there was no free will. And the second, that religion is cause of, you know, injustice or immorality and whatnot. He said, yes. I said, okay, well, let me ask you a few questions about that. I said, on the one hand, if you don't believe that there is free will, <clears throat> you, you seem to complain about these religious atrocities, which I would agree with, right? You look at 9-11. Yeah, absolutely. Totally against that. But on your view, if there's no free will, why should we hold people morally accountable for something they didn't have the freedom to do in the first place? And then his eyes kind of widened because it hadn't occurred to him, you know, to connect those dots. And then I said, but, you know, and then on the other uh, side, you seem to take pride in your atheism, which I can respect. Uh, but you have this assumption that you came to these conclusions on the basis of freely being able to follow the evidence where it leads and freely being able to change your mind. But if there's no free will, I can't help but wonder if you feel that your belief to your, your stance to be an atheist was something you were fully able to come to in a rational way to begin with, or were you just determined to believe that? And my point there being is just there's inconsistencies in the very thing that the person is trying to hold and the implications of what I, argue, I would argue are um, the entailments of what his worldview is getting at. All right. Well, let me put on my, my I'll put on my atheist hat for now. You know, you know, agnostic, but sure. my non-believer. You know, because that's the hat that I wear all the time. Sure. Um, but but um, you know, your 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 positions on all this, as far as you know, witnessing to to the non-believer. Um, yeah, I, I I agree with you that that's probably the approach to take as far as uh, uh, like like for example, like free will. Like pick pick anything, free will. Um, I deny free will, right? But I think there's something called will. And I just had that discussion with Jim Bob. Literally, there's something we were just talking about. Determinism, hard determinism, hard determinism compatibilism, and, and indeterminism. And, you know, I don't think anybody knows which position to take, right? I mean, these are philosophical points of views. And the, the atheist can take any one of them. The theist can take any one of them. Um, there are ways to argue for any of them. Um, but I don't believe that we have free will, meaning that we have the ability to choose completely fairly and unduly without any influence from external or internal forces. Um, but I do believe we have the, the ability to, to choose, which is will, not necessarily a paternal free will. There's a, there's a distinction between the two. Um, and so, um, but, but, you know, the hard determinist says, you know, hey, look, if everything is causal, then 
you're just an, an, an output from a bunch of, of physical processes that you know are doing what you're doing but just no real conscious intentional thoughts behind that and i and i think individually we all know that that's not the case right you know we all realize that we are doing a thought process and so there is do, something doing the thinking that has some kind of autonomy away from just physical processes and and so the the, the hard problem of, of consciousness is basically determining how is it that this consciousness exists how does it supervene on the physical and how do you resolve the mind body problem and these discussions are great but nobody has the, the, the perfect solution for them. And so I think that that's a good way to approach the atheist, but only because it gives the atheist the ability to go, okay, Eric brought up some great points. How do I assail these? Go look in the, uh, the, the literature and say, oh, you know, this, is, this makes sense, so I'm going to argue this against him. And it's just a, a tension of arguments. It's just a dialectic going back and forth, and that's fine. you know. Um, but it gives the, the non-believer the ability to go check it out. And that's the kind of apologetics I like. And I think, is that kind of what you're wanting them to do? You know, hey, at least go, and maybe they might side with you. Maybe say, look, I've read both sides and I, I agree with Eric here that, look, you know, free will comes from a God or whatever. And that might be their conclusion or it might not be. It's a, it's a crap game, I guess, right? <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, yeah. You're, you're definitely on the right track. So, uh, again, going back to uh, obviously, I'm a Christian, so I'm going to appeal to my Christian beliefs and say that yeah, I would say first and foremost, I don't save anyone, right? You know, on our view, that's the Holy Spirit's job. He saves, but we can we can present the evidence and and uh, uh, attempt to be convincing. And I do think people have what I. Uh, what we would call libertarian free will. Um, we can have that discussion if you'd like, but if people do have this libertarian free will and um, it's up to them to choose whether or not they choose God, if you will, um, then yes, exactly. I, I know that. Uh, so think about Mormons for, for uh, a minute. Um, so a few times a year, I work with a ministry called Maven where we, we uh, train some students how to engage a little bit of a um, understanding Christian doctrine, some Mormon doctrine, and then we take them to Utah for an entire week and we go talk to Mormons all week. Now, the statistics for Mormonism is, is that if a Mormon hears a gospel for the first time, if they convert, it will take up to seven years for them to convert from the first time they hear the gospel. I say that to say I don't expect every person I talk to to drop to their knees and give their life to Christ. As you and I both know, there's a lot of uh, emotional baggage behind one's beliefs. People aren't just purely rational machines, um, and people need to think through some things. So the way I see apologetics when it comes to evangelism is uh, uh, not a harvester, to use some biblical terminology, not as bringing in a harvest per se, but doing gardening work to set up for a harvest, if you will. And so, right, so— like you said, if I'm talking to this young man and I made him think, I may never see him again. Uh, um, I don't know where he's going, where he's going to end up at, but I at least planted a seed, if you will, to get him to at least think about these things, uh, uh, to to maybe go further, look into these. And, you know, if you wanted to have a conversation again, I'd love to. But right. My my thought process here is I, I want to be respectful, cordial, and I just want to have a, a good dialogue and give someone something to think about. Yeah, and just just keep in mind though, when you put that seed and you plant it, you have to spread around fertilizer. <laughs> so just, I'm not saying you sure. do. I'm not saying you do. Um, yeah, yeah. But but there are That's apologists right. out there that I I totally think are just BS artists. Um, you're one of the ones. You know, it's so funny. I, I I had a poll on my 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 channel, and I asked people, um, do you think that a lot of apologists, a lot of Christians, are just trying to convert people, or do you think it's just to support their own beliefs? Um, and overwhelmingly, it was to support their own beliefs. But there are a few individuals out there that I really honestly believe they're really wanting to help people. And you're one of those people, straight up. I am absolutely convinced you, you do it for the right reasons. There's no doubt in my mind about it. Um, if not, you are putting the best. You're the best actor I've ever seen, <laughs> right? Um, so I am thoroughly convinced you are sincere in your approach. And Thank I think you. that I think you have people have to start with that. I think you have to look for sincerity. Yeah. Um, because when you see apologists out there that you know are BSing people, come on, we both all I think agree that Eric and Ken Hoven and Ken Hams of the world, they're they're just out there scamming people. The the Joel Olsteins, the um um uh, oh who's that who's that who's that one guy with the the golf stream? What's his name? Uh <clears throat> Uh, yeah. Creflo Dollar, I think. No, no. Well, here's the other one. Creflo Dollar wanted a Gulfstream, too, but he's not the one I'm thinking of, actually. Um, but the one that says that he has to have the, the – again, has the, the, the Gulfstream to minister. The one that has a bug out eyes. He was on the, the Trinity, Trinity Bob. Copeland. Yes, Copeland. Copeland. Kenneth Copeland, Oh, yeah. yeah. Kenneth Copeland. So, yeah. so I don't believe any of those, right? That when I grew up in the 80s and I was listening to TBS sometimes, I never got any sense of Christianity out of it. I used to go to Christian organizations. I went to, I was, you know, I was baptized Mormon, which again, I think it's great when oh, people actually get Mormonism correct when they, when they don't straw man them because I used to be on AOL chat rooms and I would see people saying things about AOL, uh, Mormons I knew that wasn't true because I've read the literature, 
right? But they wouldn't understand. And so I still get crap for that. Oh, you're defending Mormonism. No, I'm defending what they actually believe. I don't have to believe that. Right. But when you say certain right. things that I know from my own experience, you know, because I've been to the churches, they, they, oh, you know, if they say like, oh, well, they sacrifice dead babies during sacrament, you know, stuff like that. <laughs> Weird thing. It's like, look, I've been there. I, I know that doesn't happen. But I used to go to these Christian organizations and, you know, they'd be playing the guitars and getting the kids all, you know, into the Christian youth things. Nothing wrong with that. It's a little indoctrinating, but, but, you know, it's to, to motivate the kids. But I got to tell you, Eric, the entire time I was going to these, these Christian functions, I always felt out place and never once felt any kind of spiritualism, never felt any kind of Holy Ghost, never felt any kind of uh, uh, b- b- brain state where I was going, hey, is this even closely to true? It was just like, I think these people are performative. I, I don't think that they're really even interesting, you know, in God. I think they're just making this into a social event and, and wanted yeah. people just to believe like they believe. And at that time, most of them, you know, kids, teenagers didn't have the structure behind them to under, understand the gospels. And, and that comes yeah. in time, like you said, seven years for the average convert. Right. Um, yeah. And, and so I, I mean, again, I'm on, I'm on, I'm on board with this. And if the evangelist wants to do that, that's, that's, that's their choice. You know, absolutely go for it. I want to see pushback on it, but I want to see arguments from the other side that are making sense to me. This is why I probably critique atheist arguments harder than theists because theist arguments have been out there for a very long time. They've been, you know, overdone at how, how people will say this is wrong because of this, but the atheists, they have some of the worst retorts I've ever seen. And, I, and, and as a non-believer, I want to elevate them. This is why I'm having my series on sure. on uh, lessons of, for atheism to become a better atheist, <laughs> even though I'm not atheist. Um, yeah. yeah, go ahead. I just want to throw that out there that that you're right. You know, you're not doing the converting, although you, you do have in your book, I read it more than maybe you think, but you talk about you know, these Christians that rely on the Holy Ghost to convert people, right? And and you disagree with that. And and, and I, I kind of understand why you do, but the same token, I think that, if the, if there's a, if there is a God, that's how it's gonna be done. I've only had one religious experience really, and it was a feeling that they told me was the Holy Ghost, and it felt pretty overpowering. But it was during a Mormon blessing, which Christians would be like, "Well, I can't be right because Mormons can't don't have the Holy Ghost do that kind of stuff. It's it's a you know a fake religion." And so I'm in a quandary. I'm like, the only religious experience I ever had was with a church that, you know, monastery and Christianity is saying is wrong and that, you know, I look into and has massive issues with, don't get me wrong. I mean, especially the, the book of Abraham, massive, massive uh, uh, Egyptian uh, issues. So I'm in a quandary, right? Right. So I have to recognize I felt something, but I don't know what it was. And did it feel spiritual? Eh, not really. It just was a a very burning feeling that I had uh, in my entire body, my mind, you know. Um, in your bosom. Yeah, yeah, exactly, <laughs> right, right, burning the bosom. And, but, <laughs> That's but what I, the Mormon scripture says. But I, can, but I think I can attribute to uh, natural causes now, right? Sure. So, but, but, yeah. Um. But. So, 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 what you're you're getting into my book? Um. So, what what I think you're alluding to is um, where I'm responding to a possible objection or potential objection where. Um, and this is in, in the first few chapters where, as I said earlier, I'm giving an apologetic for apologetics. And um, <clears throat> and and for those that may not be familiar, that word apologetics comes from 1 Peter 3.15. In, in the Greek, it, it says, be ready to give an answer or a defense. And that word defense or answer is the Greek word apologia. We transliterate that to get the English word apologetic. So it's just giving a defense for what you believe and why you believe it. So um, <clears throat> at this point, after kind of laying out a case, I, I deal with some possible objections. And this uh, was was actually a, a, a true story where I went, um, long story short, uh, I went to go speak somewhere. It was like for an international group of pastors and leaders, um, literally from around the world. I mean, UK, Canada, different places. And uh, I went up first and gave my my uh, typical talk on you know why we need apologetics and evangelism. And... Um, to not go into all the details of the story, one of the other speakers who spoke after me, so I'm sitting in the front row, you know, I want to listen to the other speakers, be respectful, be supportive. And then one guy, he hands out this like, um, I don't know, four by six note card that he printed out. And it was like his, his take on how to evangelize to people. And it was almost like a script, which I, I don't like. I, I even say in my book many times, what I'm showing you is not a script because as you and I both know, when you talk to someone, it's not going to, I mean, they're not going to give you the answers that, you know, your 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 typical youth pastor. So is going to say, oh, here's what the atheist is going to say. And then you say this and he's going to say this. You say that. It's not how conversations work. Yeah, it's, 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 um, very, but, it's very mis- <clears throat> it, it seems very coerced when he's scripted. It's not, a, it's yeah. not a, an organic conversation and people pick up on this stuff. That's right. Yeah. And so uh, long story short, after he gives a spill, he says, 
so he holds up his little card that he printed out and passed out. He said, so you can do, you know, what Eric told you to do, or you can do what I'm showing you how to do. And this was given to me by the Holy Spirit. And, and I'm like, well, this is really awkward. And I'm thinking, do I get a rebuttal time or something? Like, why is he, you know, uh, why, why do that in this kind of environment, whatever. But my point to that was, I, I think sometimes it, let's just stick to this story, this instance. I think people have a knee-jerk reaction, Christians who have a knee-jerk reaction to apologetics who maybe have never done it or don't understand it. Um, sometimes I think it's pride. Sometimes I think it's ignorance. In this case, what I think it was is that, you know, it's, it, you know, people say, oh, well, you know, you're going to have to study and read, and that's hard. Well, yeah, I mean, if Christianity is true, why would we expect to be able to understand an infinite God without having to do any mental exercising, if you will. And essentially what I think he was doing was giving an excuse as to why he doesn't do apologetics and trying to bring up, if you could call it an argument, a pseudo pious, sanctimonious, I'm more spiritual than Eric. So take my approach, which is not an argument. And my response to that in the book is, well, here's the irony. Again, assuming Christianity is true, the case I gave for why we should do apologetics was pointing to scripture. The case he gave for his version of evangelism, he pointed to something he wrote down. So the irony was that I was pointing to a text that, if Christianity is true, was given to us literally by the Holy Spirit. Well, literally in the sense that it was inspired by the Holy Spirit, as scripture says, whereas he was pointing to something he printed off at Office Depot just like an hour before he got there that was printed off by him. So it's like, don't don't try to pull this super, I'm more spiritual than you game when it's not even true to begin with. And, and you're just using quote unquote, the Holy spirit as an excuse to do what you want to do. You're not, you're not solo strip Tauruses, right? Though. Um, it depends what you mean by that. I mean, different people mean different things, but if not in the sense where not like strict, some precepts, not a strict one, well, well, tell me what you mean by that. Um, that all scripture only comes from the Bible <laughs> itself. No other source, no other, um, uh, declarations, no other creeds. Like what you mean to me, to me, to me, well, something that only you can back up from the Bible, like no, no, no solus for fidere, no by fidelity and grace only things of that nature. I don't know. I'm not a theologian, man. <laughs> I, just, <laughs> I, I make up these terms as I go along. Don't you know? Um, uh, well, I mean, so, what, so uh, what's your view on, on scripture as far as like what, what works for a Christian? Yeah. I mean, so, so historically speaking that, that sola scriptura was, was, um, in response to uh, the Catholic Church, you know, with Luther and everything, that Scripture is a final authority, and, and I would I would agree with that when it comes to um, theological matters. In other words, I'm not going to go to Scripture to to learn arithmetic or, or calculus. It's not what it was intended to. Um, so if, if that's what you mean by, do I think all truth? As I've heard, I've heard some precepts, presuppositional apologists say, yeah. all truth has to be grounded or come from the Bible in one way or another. I would disagree with that. Okay, yeah, I don't that's, think, that's more I think of a reformed that epistemology itself. approach. Uh, I don't know if it's I'd call a, it, it that. Doesn't, it doesn't entail it, but every presupper I know seems to probably think that way. I mean, they're very much um, assuming there's a God, precepts there's a God, and then run from that, that, um, you know, the Bible is the authority on, on all matters of Scripture. Um, and, and, well, I do think the Bible is the authority when it comes to scriptural matters but but again i'm not going to go to scripture to, to learn mathematics right um yeah. okay, whereas so, i've so heard you, some people yeah. it's not it's not a matter of science right it's not authority on, on other subjects just scripture um i i would say i affirm everything that it teaches um now it, you know without going into the whole i don't know where you're going at with the science but i'll say it this way i don't think scripture is trying to teach science yeah well there's um, because there's there's Christians out there that think that the Bible is a science book. I mean, I'm not even joking. I mean, Chris, right. uh, George Lujak was on no, right, just a little right. while ago, and he's still messaging me, and he's absolutely convinced that the science in the Bible is correct. And and so <laughs> trying to wrap your head around why a, a, it says, you know, a bat is a bird is him, oh, well, maybe God wanted bats to be birds, and, you know, we have it wrong or whatever. It's, it's, just, it's just mental gymnastics. And I agree with you wholeheartedly. Um, as a non-believer, I can distinguish and, and mentally separate scriptural reference as far as you know, the, the nature of God and all that stuff and all those religious beliefs, as opposed to the science that they had at the time. I don't think they have to be congruent in my opinion. And I get crap from that from atheists. They, these people didn't know science. They're going to get stuff wrong. Um, and when they put in the Bible, I believe the, the Bible, when you say people say the Bible is inerrant or infallible, meaning it can't be wrong or doesn't have any errors or can't be wrong. I think that's very specific rather than th this, this, some people think that, look, it can't even be wrong about science. Well, sure it can. That doesn't affect the scripture that it's talking about because I, I think that 
any book written is going to have some influence from mankind. And I don't, I don't fault the Bible for that. I disagree with for other reasons, but does that make sense that I can separate? Uh, no, two? yeah, it, it, it makes sense. And I would just say, um, without going to inerrancy and infallibility, uh, my, my point is, um, I don't think the Bible is even trying to teach science. Um, so like, for example, Genesis, right? So that's kind of the elephant in the room. Um, right. I, I don't think science, someone's asking me, well, how do we understand this scientifically? And, and my, my question to the believer asking me this is, well, why would you try to quote unquote, understand it scientifically? Do you seriously think that, you know, Moses, whenever he lived and was writing this stuff down or conveying it to the people, do you really think the biggest concern on their mind was whether or not evolution was true or how the earth was? Right. I mean, because, Jesus didn't talk about any of that stuff, right? Right. Right. In other words, they, they, it wouldn't even cross their mind. So that tells us a few things, either a, um, oh my gosh, the, the Bible has the science part wrong, or B, it's not even talking about science, and you are importing this modern Western mentality of evolution and creation into a text that wasn't even concerned about those questions, at least not here. It's not touching on that. And without going to the, the theological debate into that, I would say the sole purpose of Genesis in a nutshell is to establish God made this and it's his. So what were these people in Genesis facing? Well, they were facing pagans who would say, uh, well, you needed to worship the sun and moon god, and you need to have these ritual orgies to appease the fertility gods. Whereas Genesis comes out and says, well, God made the stars, he made the moon, he made the sun, and he made everything to reproduce after its kind. So the point there is, look, you don't have to do all these pagan rituals. When I made this, that's the creation. Don't worship the creation, worship the creator. In other words, science was not on their mind when they were writing this. That wasn't They, they weren't dealing with that. What they were dealing with were, were these pagan nations around them and these pagan gods that they were worshiping, and that's what I think Genesis is addressing. So nothing to do with age of the earth or evolution or science. It had to do with the theology and the pagans of their day. So why is it then, and Jim Bob and his crew, a lot of them are young earth creationists, and we'll be having that discussion. Um, I want to get Jackson Weed on. He's available next week. So Jim Bob, you're still out there. I'm going to get a hold of you. We're going to try to get you um, and Jackson Wheat on, non sequitur, um, to talk about evolution. Um, but why do you think that some younger creationists really put that as something that has to be in order for to God exists, at least their version of God? They, they, they cannot be wrong on this for some reason. And I think a, me personally, I think that almost all of it extends from this brainwashing that Ken Hoven, Ken Ham um, and other people in the younger community have tried to do um, to get people to be convinced of this for whatever reason. Whatever reason is there? Is, people have argued maybe there's some money to be made. I, I I don't think so. Look, I I I I I think that people most of them that write for like Answers in Genesis or Creation uh, Ministries International, uh, I think they really do believe it. I haven't known Safadi for a very long time, and I really do believe he believes this. Um, so I don't think he's doing it from some kind of monetary gain. I mean, how much is going to be made, right? I mean, he could he has a actual PhD in biochemistry, so he could utilize that if he wanted to. Um, but there are other people that I do think it, that. Um, that are not so honest. And and so when you have these younger creationists that say, look, the earth is young, here's the Bible. Don't you think they kind of like misunderstanding the purpose of the Bible as not being a science book and that you can still, because I know a lot of people that are religious, Sidegard is one of them. He's a old earth creationist, believes all the science, but of course believes that God created it. That being a young earth creationist is not something that necessarily falls from Christianity by any means. Matter of fact, it didn't even come around to Usher's, Usher's chronology. So what do you say to them? Because they're in my audience, and uh, this is where it might go off the rails, but we'll see. <clears throat> yeah, um, so good question. So obviously, you know, I, I couldn't psychoanalyze a particular person or whatnot, but I would say in my experience, um, a, a few things. At first, I'd say personally, like, I don't care how the earth is. Um, if God used evolution to bring about our species, cool. Um, I, I have my my doubts on that. But to me, it's just it's not a central core issue. So this is another aspect to what I call the lazy approach. Um, in fact, you know, what I like to do when I go to churches is is uh, I like to do like a, uh, like a, a role play where, OK, let me let me pretend to be an atheist for a few minutes and let's have a discussion. And I don't pull punches. And and of course, I throw out the 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 old earth, young earth, the evolution thing to see if they jump on that and 99 percent of the time they do and when i when we stop the role play and do a debrief one of my first questions is um is this essential for salvation right can a person believe in evolution and go to heaven can a person believe in an old earth and go to heaven if the answer is yes which yeah that's not a criteria for being saved well then why are we spending so much time on this why why make that such a huge obstacle and, and die on that hill when it's not relevant to whether or not someone can be saved and know Christ. So 
why do other people do it? I, I don't know. Um, I, they might be convinced that that's necessary. I, I've heard the arguments why. I don't think they're, they're convincing. But again, I, I, I can summarize it in this way. I like to ask the crowd, raise your hand if you're going to go into the afterlife with some false theological beliefs. And obviously that's everybody, right? And my point is, well, I would rather have someone go to heaven with false theological beliefs than go to hell with false theological beliefs, right? So I want to keep the main thing the main thing. So if someone is adamant about believing in evolution, uh, but they're willing to become Christians, cool. Um, if if evolution's not true, well then, hey, we'll both find out in heaven. If evolution is true, well then we'll both find out in heaven as well. You know, so in other words, it's not a deal breaker when it comes to whether or not Christianity is true. I would say two things at minimum make Christianity true. God exists, Jesus rose from the dead. If those two things are true, everything else is a secondary issue. Yeah, the argument that they run, and a, a very bad argument, I think, but the, ar the argument is basically, look, if you accept evolution, you're denying God's creation, you're making God out to be a liar. I don't think that follows logically. Um, but, you know, I, I think there's some, you know, major issues that need to be at least resolved. I'm not saying that they're make or break um, incompatible, but there are some things that have tension with each other between the, the narrative of Adam and Eve and, you know, creation as far as an old earth type creationist where the universe has been around for billions of years there there's just some incongruity incongruities there um and that's fine but as you said why is it that they're so willing to die on that hill um i i don't know i think it's because they have been so and again i hate this word but indoctrinated and brainwashed to think that young earth creationism is true and it could be no other way and they're not even willing to entertain that that could be wrong now people may remember i had a debate with Wayne Fillmore years and years ago. What, you know, great guys, friends with him to this day, and he was a young earth creationist, and he kept challenging me to debate Mac Revolution. I'm not a biologist, but you know, I spent a couple weeks preparing for it because I was like, okay, I like this guy. I really want to see if I can get through to him. And and during the debate, his mind was 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 shifting gears. And he actually agreed with me by the end of the debate about some things and then a month later he you know took some time off and a month later he left young creationism and he is thanking me ever since he's became a science teacher oh. yeah um and it, he wrote a, a personal blog on bio logos uh, you're all familiar with bio logos um and he, he uh you are right bio logos you familiar yeah. With him? yeah i'm familiar with it yeah yeah uh you look to me blank and i'm like i'm pretty sure you know it. Uh, but he wrote a personal blog on there and um it's one of those very few times where you can ch get somebody to change the position but he's still christian is the point He's still very much Christian, but he, he, he actually thanked me for making a better Christian because, as you said, you know, people have false beliefs, whether you, you go to heaven, go to hell or neither. Um, we're going to all die with false beliefs. You cannot have perfect beliefs. And for, uh, for my argument to, to you, people out there, and I want you to, to, to address it, is that if you have a misconception about evolution, and that's been studying the science, which is supposed to be philosophy of nature, and that is supposed to be natural law, and you get it wrong— why would God condemn you for that? That doesn't seem a very just and righteous God to me. It really doesn't. And if you get the theology wrong, it doesn't even seem like a righteous God to me. I think that if people die. If, if God exists and he's just, he'd be like, hey, look, I gave you this this in life, but maybe it wasn't enough. Do you want to take one last shot at the apple? Um, and you're like, hey, Jesus, yeah, cool, man. I, I'm down with it. Or no, nope, screw you. I, you know, I'm out of here. Uh, maybe a form of universalism. I don't know. But I still think a lot of people should have second chances. And some Christians have argued that I've had a Christian told me, Hey Steve, no matter what, you know, you're going to be able to decide afterwards anyways. And I already think you're saved because you're a good person. Um, and God's not going to let you go to hell. He's going to give you, you know, give you an opportunity after you die. I've had Christians tell me this straight up, whether you agree with it or not. Um, so there is no one size fits all, but, but do you, do you want to let my audience know this young creationist that look, just because, you know, some accepts evolution doesn't mean they're going to hell. Uh, yeah. And, and, um, um, and I want to be clear too, cause I don't want to, uh, someone to take me out of context and you know how you said you get it from both sides. I, I am no stranger to that getting hate we from really both do. sides for, yeah. So, um, one, one thing is, so I, I do think, I don't think you'll have a quote unquote second chance, but I also, this, this will us way deeper. Don't care to really expand on this, but suffice it to say that if Molinism is true, God knows every possible outcome and everything it would take for someone to believe or not believe on this side of heaven. Right. And so middle, post middle death, knowledge, middle knowledge. Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and so I, I reject universalism. I don't think there'll be a second chance of death, but all that to say is going back to what, what your point. Um, yeah. So I don't, I don't, 
again, I don't I don't think the Bible's te- trying to teach science, and I don't think these are core issues when it comes to salvation. Um, yes, I think that uh, you know we'll go into the afterlife with false beliefs, some false theological beliefs. Uh, no, I don't think you have to. I'll put it this way. How we put it in the book, you don't have to pass a theological exam to get into heaven. Um, what scripture teaches is that you are saved by grace through faith. You are not saved anything that you do. You are saved by what Christ did, and you are accepting that free gift of salvation. So there's nothing that uh, you can do to earn your salvation. Uh, it is a gift of God based on what Christ did. So all that to say, when it comes to the, the whole making non-core issues core issues, I, I think when Christians do that, they shoot themselves in the foot and and harden people's hearts further from the gospel and from becoming um, Christians and followers of Christ. So, for example, I, I had a um, this lady one time. She was she was talking with me, and and again, I don't I don't care how old the Earth is. Uh, I don't believe in evolution, but I, it it wouldn't crush my faith if I found out. Oh, God used evolution. It's not a big deal to me. Well, you don't you don't believe. Um, let's clarify. You, you don't really believe in human evolution because you believe in soul instantiation. I would I would imagine, but you do accept that life goes back four billion years. Whether how we're how we're related to that, right? There's, um. There's so I, I I don't mind I don't mind saying I'm agnostic on that because okay. I, I really I, I really don't care. Well, it's not your um, area that you really dive into that much. You're, you don't really get right. into the biology. Yeah, I'm not opposed to it, but right. I'm also right. it. I, I'm not interested enough to to fair pick enough. up a book on it, you know. Fair, fair, fair enough. So, um, and and I want to say it's just because of soul thing, because I believe animals have souls. Um, so, but but again, it's just not to me. It's not relevant to what I care to study, what I think is necessary for salvation, and for what it, it interests me when it comes to these things. Um, yeah, and what I what I don't do is I don't make. Yeah, that's right. I don't make these core issues, and and I would, and, and I'm not even telling people don't be a young Earth creationist. Look, if you want to be a young Earth creationist, old Earth, it's fine. Again, I don't take a position. What I would encourage people not to do is not make it a salvific issue. Mm-hmm. Um, going back to this lady, she said, uh, "Well, what are you going to do when you see these people, these young teenagers, leaving the faith because they?" come to believe in evolution and old earth, what would you do? I say, I would stop making it a core issue because yeah. if it wasn't a core issue, they, would they wouldn't leave for those right, reasons. They wouldn't leave. Right. Right. No. Exactly. That's exactly right. <laughs> it, exactly. They wouldn't, if they stop making a core issue, then people wouldn't be leaving the church. Because look, at, and I will tell you from experience, when people tell me I have to, to give up evolutionary theory and science and accept some kind of young earth narrative to become Christian, I will tell you right now, I will deny that t- forever. They're wrong. They're out. I, I, you know, I believe they're absolutely wrong. I mean, it's like if somebody said, hey, Steve, you have to give up the laws of logic. You have to assume that X equals not X to become Christian and be saved. I'll be like, well, you know, I'm screwed because there's no way I can do that. One, I couldn't mentally convince myself. Right. right. Because I do accept Dossastic and voluntarianism. And so I, I don't I can't force myself to believe something. But right. they, you're absolutely right. When I have young earth creationists telling me it's a, it's a salva- salva- uh, salvic, sal- salvation, salvific, salvific, <laughs> thank you, <laughs> salvific, salvific. Oh, I hate that word, salvific. <laughs> Just say it for me. Salvific. <laughs> thank you. Um, issue um, that I'm obviously not going to become their particular brand of Christianity. And matter of fact, I'm probably going to have pushback as a whole against Christianity. But if I talk to someone like maybe you or Sigart, where they don't make that a core issue, I'm I'm much more, you know, inclined at least to, to say, okay, the God that you believe in is at least a little more plausible or, or you know, all the gods are possible, I guess, in that way, but plausible, right? That makes sense? Uh, yeah, and, 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 you know, to be clear again, just because I'm thinking of the Christians in the back of my mind who want to try to take something out of context. Yeah, I'm, I'm agreeing with you in the sense that I, I'm not— I'm not agreeing in that, oh, yeah, you, we can just take any God you want, and that's not what you're saying, so I want to make that clear. Uh, but what I think you are saying is that, look, if, don't don't make these core issues to the point to where you're going to have someone reject a God that I certainly believe and I would say no exist. Uh, you would say maybe possibly exist, but don't make them reject such a God on the basis of something that's not even an issue that Scripture presents as an issue. Correct. Um, and I think that's very wise words. And I, and I really hope that younger creationists take that to heart because I think, I think all the way they're doing is they're driving people away from the gospel. And, and as an atheist or even as a non-believer, I can go, yeah, cool. You know, I, I, I would, I'm not minding people leaving religion, obviously, but I at least want people that are in religion to at least have a better understanding of what they believe and not force it upon others and not be so judgmental and certainly not, you know, condemn people. Um, for not believing the way they do. I understand scripturally how they can condemn people. And I get where some people believe that people are not going to be saved. I understand that. 
But I mean, like treat people with disrespect merely because they're not that particular flavor of, of religion or as myself and non-believers an atheist, I've seen theists just, you know, mock atheists like, oh, atheism is so stupid. It's so irrational. That's not going <laughs> to, dang, <laughs> the roofing. I don't know if you heard that. God's That's getting mad at you. Yeah. God, God. Is that a sign? Um, <laughs> That's right. Wow. Um, but uh, that, uh, that the, the 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 I've lost my train of thought. That was God intervening. Um. Anyways, run with it because I I totally lost my train. Yeah. Of thought. So um. <clears throat> yeah. So I mean, just essentially that, and also I I don't think um I don't think people are quote unquote leaving the faith because they come to believe the Earth is old or they might you know believe in evolution. Otherwise, you wouldn't have theistic evolutionists and old Earth creationists. Right. Um, yeah. I Dr. think Dr. Hugh Ross, if, Dr. Fuzzrana, great yeah, that's guys. right. Yeah. Yeah. So so if they are, quote unquote, le leaving the faith because of those issues, it's only because they have been taught that these were core issues to begin with. And I don't think that should have happened in the first place. Yeah. And and, and I, I always wonder, why is it? You, OK, look, on one side of the fence, like with reasons to believe uh, who I've worked with before, a great organization, don't agree with them spiritually and theologically. But, um, you know, even even science, some things that I, I disagree with, but they at least really want to have the topics. Right. And you have, so you have Dr. Hugh Ross and Dr. Foz, Fuzrana who are old with creationists. And then you have on the other side, Dr. Humphreys, Dr. Snelling, Dr. Um, Sarfati and these young, the creationists. And I, and I asked people, what is it that you believe about the younger creationists that you don't believe about the actual scientists? You know, the science they are still doing science or at least have you know, paperwork in this area. Because if you look at the younger creationists, all their PhDs, have nothing published on the young earth creationism in the literature. It matter of fact, everything that they have assumes an old earth to get their PhDs. So what is it about, because you know, I'm not trying to appeal to authority or say that, that they are, but what is it that they will believe the young earth creationist, but they're not going to believe the old earth creationist when they're both Christians. How do they in their mind accept one, you know, as, as authoritative, like the young earth creationist, you have to be. And, and I, I, to me, it's weird. It, it's very, very weird how they just assume that the young creationists are giving them the truth and by fiat discount the old creationists, who I get along with exceptionally well because they at least accept most of the science. Yeah, and, and uh, as a side of two, you know, to, to reiterate, I mean, I, I personally don't care what a believer wants to hold to when it comes to these issues as long as, you know, there's the understanding that these are in-house debates that we should be charitable out charitable about and allow people to have different views um so all that to say you know one thing i don't like that i see is um when i see people it, it goes back to this pseudo piety almost like this who's more spiritual kind of a match where like for example again i'm i wouldn't consider myself neither young nor old i just i don't care um, but I find myself oftentimes having to defend older creationists, not because I agree with them or disagree with them. Again, I, I'm agnostic on it, but because I see people misrepresenting them. Yeah. And so, Good for point. example, you, you know, I, I had a one time um, this guy was saying, no, it has to be young, yada, yada, yada. And I forgot what I said, but his response was, well, God cannot lie in his word. And God can't be wrong. I said, well, I agree with you. God cannot be wrong, but you can be wrong. <laughs> and your interpretation of God's word could be wrong, and you could be lying about yeah, God's you're word. You're not so, infallible. You're God maybe, but you're most that's certainly right. not. <laughs> and that's where I think uh, when when the discussion is set up as, you know, even, and I won't mention the name of this person, but, you know, uh, a well-known young earth creationist where, you know, he says, well, I don't like to call myself young earth creationist. I call myself a biblical creationist as if to imply that if you don't believe what he does, then your view is unbiblical right. or that you don't believe that, you know, scripture is a word of God, yada, yada, yada. All my old earth friends, even my theistic evolutionist friends, none of them will say, I believe this because I disagree with the Bible, they'll say the opposite. So you can't pit it as if one group is trying to be faithful to Scripture, whereas the other group is just these infidel Christians in wolf in sheep clothing or something. Yeah, I, I don't think I can recall a single solitary Old Earth creationist um, that has ever argued you have to accept Old Earth creationism to go to heaven. I, they've never made it. Uh, what's the word again? Yeah. Sal sal Salvific. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. um, I, I can't say certain words. I just, I, I people know I have a speech impediment that I went to speech pair through for, oh. for years. Um, yeah, I, I really did. I, I, you know, I was a kid that got dragged out of class to do speech therapy, you know, mm. embarrassing, but yeah, certain words I just have a very difficult time with. Um, but, but anyways, long story short, um, I've never had a, a Old Earth creationist Make that something that has to do with salvation. It's it just to them. It's look. They want you to be actually educated in the science because um, if you have falsities in your scientific foundations, then you're going to have misconceptions about 
you know, science in general, and 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 that's going to be you know, poor when people want to go to college and learn about these topics from universities. Same thing in philosophy. You know, when 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 I tell people this is how it is, you know, in the literature because I can read the literature and I'm not an idiot. And so this is this is how it is. And if you don't accept it, that's fine. But don't say it's not taught that way, because if you do go take these courses, this is how it's going to be. Same thing in math. Right. If you, if you, you know, we're, we're going back and having a discussion on point nine, nine, repeating equals one, even though I think Jim Bob agrees with me on, on it now. But some of his followers didn't accept that. That's math. And if you have a bad understanding in math, how are you going to get through Calc one and two? Or further, how, how, is, how is this going to happen if you don't understand certain types of mathematics like limits of sequences or, 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 or partial sums? It's not going to happen. You have to have start with sound foundations. And as an apologist, do you agree that you and I, to build a solid epistemic and dostastic framework, have to have some kind of foundations? We just go about it different ways. And I'm not going to even say one is better than the other epistemically. It's just what approach we take. Yeah, so I would definitely. So I'm I'm more concerned and interested. In, you know, so I've told you what I don't care about. I'm more concerned and interested in the philosophy. You know, the metaphysics. Uh, and, you know, I I would uh, submit that in mathematics and philosophy is where you learn rigorous analytical thinking. It's where you learn how you know your laws of logic. It's where you learn how to identify logical fallacies. So if you have a firm foundation, philosophically speaking, then you can sniff out the. Uh, manure, if you will, type of arguments. You don't even have to disagree with the conclusion. So, for example, let's let's suppose you know the young Earth creationist is correct. Well, okay, that's fine and dandy, but don't argue in a way that's disingenuous or arguing in a way where you're already trying to set up or frame the debate in such a way to where you're you're pitting your pitting the person who disagrees with you as if they're somehow not Christian or not saved or not biblical. So learning critical thinking skills, I think, goes a long way. And I go back to what I said in the beginning. This is part of loving God with our mind. And if we serve an omnipotent, omniscient, infallible, logically orderly God, and we are made in his image, then we should reflect that in our engagements. Yeah, the uh, critical thinking, I think, applies to all sides. This is like I, what I like to do on my blog and my, my channel and my programs is that to be a critical thinker, um, you have to incorporate certain ingredients for rationality, certain properly based beliefs, certain axioms, and certain things about critical think uh, involve logic. And and I and I've noticed that some of the atheists will eschew logic just to keep their 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 argument going. They'll just throw it away like it's nothing. Um, but if you're not a critical thinker, then how is it you're going to come to any conclusion that that even remotely is based upon some kind of uh, um, reasonably accurate uh, decision-making formula, some kind of, I got to, sorry, I got a leaf blower and I'll, I'll finish this up. But if you have to be able to come to a conclusion rationally. There you go. No, absolutely. And yeah, I agree with you. That that applies to all sides, you know, a believer, non-believer, whatever you want to call yourself. Um, yeah, we should learn to think critically and, and there is a truth of the matter out there and let's follow the evidence where it leads. Um, you know, one of the things that got me into, uh, philosophy and just apologetics in general, because I, I, I studied philosophy before I even in, took a deep dive or look into apologetics or theology. I didn't know what apologetics was at the time, but long story short, um, <clears throat> uh, freshman year of college, I remember uh, taking a, my first philosophy class because I, I just I needed to fill an, fill an elective, and I thought philosophy was like sharing your opinion and making stuff up. And I'm like, I could do this in my sleep. I could skip this class if I need to. This would be perfect, the perfect elective. I remember one time my youth pastor, he said, if anyone ever asks you to prove God exists, all you have to do is tell them, prove to me he doesn't. And I thought, oh, that's brilliant. I'm going to put it in my back pocket, whoever need it. First week of philosophy class, my oh, professor that's so says. <laughs> that's so bad. <laughs> yeah. First week of philosophy class, my professor says, um, you know, we're going to we're going to start with talking about something called the burden of proof. And he says, you know, basically, if you make a claim, you bear the burden of proof. It. And then he said, as a random example, which I later found out was not random because I later learned he was an atheist. He said, as a random example, if if you claim God exists, then you bear that burden to prove it. So if someone asks you to prove it, you cannot reply and inappropriately shift the burden of proof by saying, prove to me he doesn't, because if you make the claim, you bear the burden. But when he said that, it made sense, and I felt like my house of cards just collapsed. But my thought wasn't, "Oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, you know, uh, drop this class." My thought was, "Well, if this guy's right, and if God exists, then it's not God that's wrong; it was my youth pastor, and so I shouldn't be afraid to keep learning." And I was intrigued; I loved it. Uh, he was very even-handed. Um, I liked the way he presented stuff. He encouraged questions. And then next semester rolls around. I want to take another class in philosophy. 
everyone warns me not to take Professor Pena because he's he's an atheist. He's going to try to make you lose your faith. But that, again, it, it intrigued me. So I took his class intentionally, and he – and it was that class where I first heard an argument against the soul. And from that day forth, I was hooked uh, just because – I found questions I didn't even know I had, uh, and I began to just take a deep dive, and it's just like, my goodness, it, there is so much to learn and and grow in and know about God, creation, all this stuff, uh, the universe, the way the world works, metaphysics. And then I look you know, behind me, and I see people arguing about how old the earth is, and I'm like, seriously? Like that, that's what you want to folk. That's what you want. That's the hill you want to die on. So for me, it, I'm more intrigued in, in the fundamentals of, of thinking, of analyzing and things like that. Let me ask you in your course, because, you know, I've written about burden of proof quite a bit and I've gotten flack from both sides, mostly the atheists, because, again, I think their version of burden of proof is a straw man. I mean, in the literature, it actually goes into much more detail about what it means. And it is more than just onus probandi. It's much more than just the legalese that came from. Um, there are many different types of burden of proof. Did you learn about epistemic burdens, discursory burdens, um, burden refutation, burden of rejoinder, burden of defense, all burdens of proof, but in the negation for the most part. Um, but everybody, and I try to explain this to, to, to atheists. Yes, what you said is definitely burden shifting, right? If you say, hey, a God exists, and somebody says, well, Prove it. You say, well, prove that he doesn't. Burn shifting, but it has to be remembered that proof in that context does not mean one a logical proof. It means basically to give reasons for your belief, and that's only if you have one a burden of persuasion that you want to convince somebody. Then you have a, a, a obligatory uh, onus, or if you're having a discursory a, a discussion and you want to be able to, to have a, a dialectic and, and talk about it. But other than that, if I believe. There's a God. I have no onus to anybody to prove anything or to demonstrate anything or give evidence for because that word proof is so um, equivocated. And I think that's really important to understand because if somebody could actually prove God exists or doesn't, we wouldn't be having these conversations. Right. So that word proof really means to provide reasons for. And I, right. and I really think that people need to understand that because the burden of justification and the burden of proof are often synonymous terms about one, the reasons why you hold your belief. The reasons why you hold it's true, and we're going to discuss that on my channel after this, this show, uh, because tr belief and veracity are not the same thing. Um, you know, veritability of, of that that particular truth, the um, verticality of it, and 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 if I if I say to you I can do this, then yeah, you have an onus to to do this if you want to convince the person. But if you don't, you have no onus whatsoever. I can say, hey Eric, I can prove to you that 0.99 repeating equals one, and you can say, okay, do it. I'm like, well, I don't have no interest in doing that to you. Perfectly fine with that. I have no, I have bared nothing by merely telling you unless you have speech act theory you, you you you're taking it as a actual you know claim in speech act theory. But there's other ways around that where it doesn't imply any esoteric force. Um, and so it really means very much different semantically when you say something like, I can prove this, right? But the reality is, I don't have to do jack crap. I, I, I have, I, I, if, I, if you said, hey, prove this, and I said, no, I don't want to, what are you going to do to me, man? What, right. what, you know, what, what's retaliatory? <laughs> what's going to be the response? You know, no, the most you're going to say is, okay, well, you know, have a nice day. I don't want to have a conversation with you. Sure. And this is what I find with atheists who say, well, I don't believe the theist. I'm like, okay, great. Have a nice day. Yeah, you, 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 you've accused yourself from the conversation when you're pulling the Matt Dillahunty. Oh, I don't believe you convince me. Who the hell are you? Right. And, and so yeah. did you have to learn any of that stuff in your class or, or did like when you read some of my writings on burn <clears throat> proof? Was it was a little because we talked about, it, I think, in, in Texas, too. Um, is it a little bit more? Oh, wow. Maybe there's more to it than, than just, oh, prove this, you know, and who has the, the a person make a positive claim has the burn of proof, which is, again, a trope. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, no, I mean, in that class, we didn't go that that deep into it. And, you know, since then, it was years ago, you know, I've, I've learned of others I haven't taken a deep dive. But, yeah, essentially to what you're getting at, which you're correct in that, um, yeah, if, if you're trying to have a discussion with someone and you're making a claim, you bear the burden, whether it be a positive, quote unquote, positive or negative claim, you're still making a claim. And whoever makes a claim bears a burden is how I like to just simplify it. Um, but granted, if, if we're at the store and I say I believe this and you say prove it and I say don't want to. Okay. <laughs> right, cool. Right. You know, have, yeah, you're not having a conversation yeah. with a person. You know, it's not a, a, a an actual dialogue, an argumentation, right? Right. 
Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, I, like you said, I mean, we don't owe anyone anything, so to speak. Um, now, of course, depending on the context, you know, as a as a believer, I would encourage all Christians who are listening that First uh, Peter three fifteen, I think, is getting at something similar to a burden of proof when it says. Be ready to give an answer for anyone who asks you for the hope that is in you. So, you know, biblically speaking, I would say that, yes, every believer should be able to give a justification, a reason for why they believe what they do. Um, now, granted, you know, I think the same would apply where if you're at a grocery store and, you know, or I'm I'm late for, I don't know, dinner at home. I'm not going to set my family aside because somebody asked me, why are you a Christian? OK, when I got to spend right, this time, course. you know, yeah, I, right. I don't yeah. think that's what anyone means either, you know, right. And by the way, be yeah. ready for it doesn't mean you have to. Sure, yeah, that's right. Yeah, be prepared to, right? Be equipped to. That's yeah. right. Yeah, and, and and I find that in the Facebook groups too because I'll run my arguments in theist in atheist <clears throat> um, Facebook groups, right? Debate groups, and like one group they've known me for years, and the admins and I agree on a lot of things. So like, hey, Steve, post whatever you want. Post your channel. It doesn't matter. We we agree with you. Have have carte blanche, right? And uh, so I'll post an argument and. You know, I'll, I'll get some atheists having this knee-jerk Pavlonian type response to it, like on the burden of proof or something. And automatically, one, they think I'm a theist, right? I mean, I've even named a fallacy on that to prove that God. Um, but it, it, it basically, it's like, oh, you're saying something that I only hear from the theist camp. You must be a theist, even though it is basic epistemology, right? We're arguing right. about what That's it right. means to have an onus. We're arguing what it means to have a claim. We're arguing what it means to have a belief. We're arguing about if it has assetoric force. We're arguing what it means in semantic theories. These are all things that come up. And so I'll say something on a Facebook page, you know, on the group, basically stuff that's not even contested. Stuff that is just so normative in epistemology that nobody even argues against it, right? But I'll still have atheists argue against it. And and, and it, it just, okay. Um, uh, yeah, go ahead, go ahead, no, finish uh, your okay, thought. Okay, so, I, and it's, it's just, it's just <clears throat> mind-blowing that they're arguing against these, these, fundamentals of epistemology just because they've been so indoctrinated on a single trope that the burden of proof is on the claimant which again doesn't always necessarily follow especially in speech act theory you can make a statement that has no assetoric force in fictionalism in um instrumentalism mm. um in even an acting class and so i love speech act theory for that very reason i find it very interesting semantics and my paper that you've read is on what semantics and yet people have said oh well your paper is just semantics and logic well yes but so what what's what is, how is that a defeater it's not like it's trivial these are these are not trivial points that i'm making here um but but anyways i i i just wanted to point that out to you that uh, i get that i get that from atheists all the time on the burden proof and it drives me freaking crazy yeah yeah no i i, I hear you i'm glad you're doing it not me because i've said give me an egg so <laughs> yeah. um do you, do you have to go uh yeah pretty soon yes I, well, yeah, no, and we're we're getting close. Let's just take a couple more, a couple questions from live chat, and we'll start wrapping it up. But I, you know, I, I definitely gonna have you back on. People, people, I guess know who you are now. You've been making a name for yourself. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what it is. Yeah, oh, well, thank you. it's your approach. You're, you know, you're very personal, man. Um, like I said, you were just very genuine, and I'll give you a compliment that I give very few people. So okay. Go ahead. Um, I've given it to a coworker, um, and Sigart, and 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 Fuzron and a few other people. Um. You're the type of Christian that I think if most people were Christian, there wouldn't be so much pushback. You you mm -hmm. you actually talk the talk and walk the walk. And I have the utmost respect for the guy, that kind of, of evangelism or your your apologetics or whatever you want to call it. Um, it's it's not intrusive. It's not you know confrontational. It's raising the bar to talk about the to, the topics. Um, and and I again I think if a lot of people were like that, it wouldn't be so contentious online now. Also, I, do I do I don't do I dislike the contention? No, I get a kick out of it every so often, right? So I, I'm not gonna have all the contention go away. Yeah. Um, but you know, I think people could really learn from your style. Uh, and and Thank people you. wanted to get into apologetics. You're you're the approach to take. And I know made by Jim Bob is getting into apologetics. Um, I think he's deciding what kind of path he's kind of going. Um, but I <laughs> I tell you, Eric, I had a guy on my channel, Rob. L nice guy has has some issues but nice guy and i'm not gonna speak ill of him by any means but he's been blocked by a lot of people um because he's very mercurial uh very capricious in, in his in his in his like bipolar type thing but he comes across as very aggressive uh very hmm. confrontational like the atheist sucks kind of stuff approach and sure that's an approach you can take but it does it hasn't gotten him anywhere right same thing with like red pill uh, uh, uh alive you know josh brister nice guy 
but he came across as very, very aggressive. And he's taken an approach back now. He's walking it back. And he's like, you know what? Maybe I do need to take a softer approach. What, what, do, you, what, do, you say, what do you say to those kind of apologists that are very, very um, heavy-handed? And then we'll kind of wrap it up. Uh, yeah, I mean, don't be a jerk, uh, you know, right? Uh, you, it, again, it, it to, to me, it's bizarre. And, and again, I don't want to psychoanalyze people. But if if you're you truly believe God exists and Christianity is true and you're truly trying to follow Christ, why would you represent something that Christ would not represent? Uh, why would you not? And, and 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 I think now the other hand, I think it's a dumb argument when you know um, non-believers say, "Well, I'm not a Christian because Christians are hypocrites." It's like, okay, atheists are hypocrites too. Like, what? That that's not relevant to whether it's true or false. Nevertheless, I think if Christians would um, not be jerks. You know, engagements, I think that would at least take away some of the bad arguments because there would be nothing to point at. Now, I'm not saying that would make it true, just like I'm not saying it would make it false. But yes, um, gosh, at, at the end of the day, you know, as believers, we believe God exists, Christianity is true, and that we should imitate Christ. So why start your evangelistic efforts in a way that is not uh, 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 picturesque or exemplary of what Christ would do? So you're already starting on the wrong foot on so many levels that i mean it's just like i would rather have the person not do it to begin with yeah and it gives an entrenchment effect and backfire effect um so one question we'll get yeah. so brian he's been around for a long time he, he, and i i know you can spend days on this so parse it um but uh, he asked can eric give just can eric just give a clear and concise um argument for for christianity basically uh can 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 eric give a clear and, and easy to understand argument for christianity not a vague god for Christianity in particular, yeah, I would say the resurrection. Um, if I would say if Christ rose from the dead, Christianity is true. Now, how deep we can go into that in like five minutes, uh, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, but I would not very. Um, I, I would point to the work of guys like Habermas and Lincona, um, and, and I use a modified version of of what's something called the minimal facts approach, where essentially you you take um, the the facts surrounding the reports of the resurrection and the life and death of Jesus uh, that are going to be agreed upon by virtually every scholar in the field, whether they're atheist, agnostic, uh, skeptic, what have you. And you look at these facts that are well established, uh, things like um, uh, postmortem appearances. You know, Jesus appeared to people after he died. Um, that something like a skeptic, Garrett Ludermann, uh, would would concede. Now, obviously, Ludermann wouldn't think they're physical appearances. He would call them experiences. But my point being is that's a historical fact that scholars across the board, virtually every scholar, would say, yes, this happened historically. The origin of the Christian faith, that the disciples genuinely believe Jesus rose from the dead. And then I would also argue the empty tomb. Um, without going into all the details, if these things are true, what best accounts for these facts historically? And I would submit it would be the resurrection. And especially in light of when you look at some of the alternative naturalistic theories, like the swoon theory, which I don't even know if, how many I'm people not, hold I, to that anymore. I, I'm not, I, I don't think the swoon theory is that popular. popular. Yeah, it used to be all the rage, you know, yeah, back in the yeah, day. But it, yeah. it's it's still because there haven't been too many alternatives put forward, even though it's not very popular. That's it's like it's still all. I mean, it's a plausible, it, but it's, it, it's it's not the by any means a prevalent theory. Right, right, and and I think it's telling that there aren't too many prevalent theories because you know, uh, so you have swoon theory, you have your disciples lied, um, you have um, you know the hallucination theory, all of which do not account for all the facts. Just, and without, think, oh, oh, I'm sorry. No, go ahead, please. I was, I was just going to say, I just think that, that their conclusions didn't follow from um, a, a rational uh, following of, of the of their beliefs, right? I mean, to me, if you follow coherentism, their beliefs going to comport with their other beliefs, right? And so if you have some other beliefs, they're going to influence inferentially newer beliefs. And so I think, think that they, even though they might have a reliable thought process, it didn't at this particular time give them a correct conclusion. I don't think they lied. Um I think they, they were true, true believers, but I think that the conclusion was false, which, I mean, I don't think that's really a contentious approach. You can disagree with it, but I think it's fair, isn't it? Uh, well, that's interesting you say that uh, because so you have a copy of my book. You know, Feel free to check out those chapters. It's the last few yeah. chapters on the mm -hmm. resurrection. But what I think is interesting in what you just said here is is that's actually uh, – so, so first, you're talking about coherentism. So what they came to believe was not what the Jews would have believed. So that's another point of historical fact contention that we need to say, what is Ebeck's explanation for this? What do I mean by that? Again, very briefly, um, is that the Jews 
in the Jewish mindset, there was a final resurrection at the end of time uh, when Christ. Uh, there was a final resurrection at the end of time. They they were not expecting individual resurrections. In the Jewish belief, there was no expectation of a Messiah that would die and rise or resurrect. Um, I, I go through the details of my book, but it is interesting and telling that you have these Jewish belief. In fact, they even expected the Messiah to be this. Uh, dictatorial political leader that would overthrow the government and establish his kingdom. And you see evidence of this in the Gospels when they were saying things like, um, hey, can we sit at your right and left hand when you establish your kingdom? And Jesus is like, you know, later on when he's on trial, says my kingdom's not of this world. So what radically changed their mind from their initial expectations over the Messiah to post-death and what they would call the resurrection changed their belief in not only their eschatological views on resurrection, but changed their beliefs on what the Messiah was supposed to be like and immediately start a religion that they had initially abandoned to begin with whether you whether you agree that it's christianity or not if that's the answer there has to be an explanation for this for what we know historically to have happened so i wouldn't say that their beliefs kind of set them up to believe this i would say it was the exact opposite their beliefs would would not have expected a dying rising messiah well, they, they, they still had the belief there was a Messiah, right? So, I mean, I, I would say three things, and we're not going to get into these right now. We're, we're, maybe next time. But co uh, people want to look at confirmationalism, um, confirmation, uh, hol uh, confirmational holism, and um, what is it? The, um, oh, we're going back here. Uh, I'm going to get this right. It's the uh, Durham-Quine thesis, if you're familiar with that. Uh, the Durham-Quine thesis is that we don't have beliefs that exist in a vacuum. Um, and so they're all kind of codependent. It's, a, it's a science, more of a scientific thesis that scientists don't formulate their science um, independent of any other scientific beliefs they have. And I think it's, it works for any kind of belief formation. But anyways, for another time, um, I do got to wrap this up because uh, it's getting loud out there. And I, I do want to have, a, again, a show on my channel. Uh, just, if you're not subscribed to my other channel, it's Steve McRae. Hash, just put hashtag atheism and you can probably find it because that's going to be under that series. But I will be talking about knowledge and justification, I think, after the noise goes away. They're going to be done here probably when the sun starts going down, which is about now. But, uh, Eric, let's wrap this up um, and tell people a little bit you know, where to find you, promote your stuff, and uh, how much you enjoy being on the Non-Sequitur Show so I can get more theists to come on and have these discussions because they, I don't know, they're not, they're not scared to. Don't get me wrong, but maybe they're just not, I don't know, up for it for some reason. Maybe it's me. I, oh, I, interesting. I, I don't bite their head. No, I, no, I, yeah. I, give this, I have this, I guess, I guess people have said I just, I, I'm very aggressive and i buy people head off i'll be like, where i haven't, I haven't been like that since nephilim free days but even then it was nephilim free <laughs> <laughs> yeah no i i've always known you to be very respectful very cordial um i love the fact that you know we can talk uh, even despite the fact that we have fundamental disagreements on reality you know i believe there's a god christianity is true you're a non-believer and that's fine and we can have these discussions uh we can we can both be on the same side if you will of saying hey don't be jerks to each other and let's learn to have civil dialogue let's raise the bar not lower it not just throw sling mud um so no, I, I very much appreciate you having me on and and uh, allow me to to discuss these things and even pushing back you know that that's what makes it fun um so yeah, I'd love to come back on, even talk about some of this, talk about resurrection stuff, uh, talk about soul, um, anything like that. I'd be happy to. Um, as far as myself, you can just type my name, Eric Hernandez. I'm one of the few uh, Mexican apologists, <laughs> so it shouldn't be hard to find me. Um, but yeah, you can type in my name on YouTube. Um, if you want to look at any conferences that we do in Texas, you can go to texasapologetics.org. Um, again, recently came out with this book, Lazy Approach to Evangelism, A Simple Guide for Conversing with Nonbelievers. Um, and I think it would be beneficial, believer or not, because it's it a good chunk of it is how to have respectful dialogue, how to not um, how to not uh, appeal to fallacies and whatnot, how to point, how to identify them. Um, you can find it on Amazon or the link that you put in the description to the publisher's website. I also recently contributed a chapter. And it's it's somewhere I, I don't want to get up and get it. Um, a chapter on substance dualism to a book called Faith Examined. So these are essays in honor of Frank Turk. Uh, it's a fresh rift, and uh, they asked me to contribute a chapter on the soul. So you can find that Faith Examined. You can look look that up online. Awesome. And uh, from what like I said, the parts I've read, which I mean I've read, I skimmed through quite a bit of the book. It well written. Um, you know, Thank whether, you. I agree, whether I agree with it or not is irrelevant, right? But I mean, it it is from from an if I did an internal critique. I would say that it's it's a very well written good book to read, um, and I, well, I think you. that's that's the best I can do it because again, there's parts in there I just as external critique I would have to like push back on clearly, right? Sure. Um, but you know, that's to be that's to be expected. But as an internal right. critique, I have to be fair, and I, you're I I think that you're gonna sell copies. I think it's gonna be talked about. Um, 
and maybe when some maybe sometime in the future i can dive into like specifics on it on my other channel sure uh, if you don't mind but use this video as you see fit man take clips if you want Thank again you. i'm sure that there might be people in the jim bob area that might have talk about this kind of stuff um feel free but i'm gonna wrap it up follow me on this channel like subscribe and follow me on the uh, my main or not my main my personal channel steve mccray because that's when we're going to get into the more epistemological discussions and talk about atheism and non-belief. Okay, but thank you, Eric. I'm going to take us out. You can drop thank out you. if you want because it's going to, I'm going to close stream lounge. But thank you guys for watching. Like, subscribe, and leave comments. That's the biggest thing you can do to help out the algorithm um, is leave some comments. Okay, and I will respond. Thank you, Eric. Good night. Hey, thank you. All right.